If you're interested in doing business in Africa, you have to read the Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. How many know what Perkins wrote? Okay. Now take your time and walk through it. The most important part in there is the bankers who go in to destabilize a country. Uh, my brother from uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, and then if the bankers do not get you in destabilizing the country, the next thing he mentioned in there, they send in the jackals. The jackals are the hidden men. And if they don't get you, then they send the army in. And this is what's happening to destabilize countries across the world, but it's an excellent book for you to read. Um, I mentioned earlier some uh, DVDs, and some of them are collector's items of Kwame Touré, which is on the table in the back. Uh, and I didn't mention that they were here, but they are here. All of the DVDs are just $10, but Kwame has one smash the FBI. When he deals with some of the things that the FBI did to stop this international movement of black people. So I want to just go through this quickly and I'm going to try to keep the time, Minister, uh, because um, the most important thing about a forum is your ability to let the audience participate so it's not a one-way conversation so that you can ask questions, which is most important. Now I'd like to start off with the land question. First, in Ghana, um, in the uh, Volta region that I mentioned in my earlier presentation, there's free land available. The, the airways, the group up on the Volta River, and I have to thank President Jerry Rollins, the former president. It was in 1994 when they came for the Savings Day Convention. We had our first international convention in Ghana. When I got there, I lobbied the minister hard because you need a reason, many of you, to visit Africa. There's a saying that I have in, in taking people to Africa, it's better to uh, see Africa once than to hear about it a million times. Now, you've heard about Africa and talked about it, but you got to make the ultimate sacrifice and go to Africa. Many people, they, when I come back, they say, oh, well, what kind of business can I do in Africa? How can I do business in Africa? Well, there's a lot of uh, ways to do business in Africa. Now, the Airways, who, which is a large group in 1884, when they divided Africa up, and they made this country, which was called Togoland, first controlled by the Germans, but after World War I, it ended up in the hands of the French, and, it's a long history, but they divided the airways right in half. So on the border between Ghana and Togo, you have the airways, a large group, one of them are Togolese, the others are Ghanaians, one speak English, the others speak French, but all of them speak the language of airway, which allows them to get it together and, uh, and they know that they're one people. Now, their particular area, they're giving away land based on development. You have to develop the land within three years. You can do it commercial or homes. I started working with 2020, who is Ali Salahuddin, uh, and his wife, uh, attorney Helen Giddens. And we met up in the Gambia, and I loved them because they were bringing children to Africa, giving them introduction to Africa. And I began to help them. I said, but you gotta bring them to Ghana. So I arranged for 136 of them to come to Ghana. We walked through the slave dungeons of Ghana, did that whole history piece. He uh, hooked up with a brother named Nana Akpam, who is from Detroit, he moved to Ghana a little after me uh, when I moved there in 1990. Nana Akpan, now you remember this, you're gonna have problems. If you say, well, there's a split, there's this group and that, all of that is the problem. Minister Farrakhan said to me the other day when we talked about Cornell West, Harry Belafonte, and those that were on that panel, and Tavis challenging what the minister said in, in disagreement with him, he said that disagreement is good. It allows us to share ideas come to consensus and move forward. How can you get the yin and the yang unless there's disagreement? But you gotta be big enough to be able to deal with disagreement. But if you're narrow and can't deal with someone who opposes your view, you can never move forward. So there, there's a little riffle with the Detroit group and going about the land, but you can't let that stop us from moving forward. That's what the enemy like. Let those Negroes argue with one another and they will never move off first base, okay? We get stuck on stupid, but we can move forward even if we disagree with certain things, we should be able to move forward. So Minister Farrakhan made this statement. Um, they're giving away this land, there's a, a free, DVD on the land. Now, I don't have enough for everyone in the audience, so we tied it into your purchase of one of the other DVDs. We'll give them out to you. 
But in the DVD, you'll see the land. Now, I tell people who want to do business in Africa, you don't do business in Africa in the blind and by remote control. You got to go and look at the business. It's got to be hands on. Otherwise, forget it. I'm going to sit in America. I'll look at a map. I'll determine what I want to do, and I'll do business in Africa. It don't happen that way. And so you have to go there, look at the land, see what you want to do, and then be able to do business in Africa. The, the Africa, they don't sell land because, as my brother said very beautifully, land is the soul of the people, and you have to understand that. The soul of the African is tied to his land. I have not met one African that's looking forward to dying, from the continent, who's looking forward to dying in America. They can come here, work, send money back home, and do that, but what they want to do, they're building a home back home, they're saving money, and what they want to do is return to the land that nourished their soul. And when they die, they want to be planted in that land. So the land is sacred, so a part of the struggle of the people of Zimbabwe, when they became independent on May 18, 1980, there was a long struggle before that. The agreements at Lancaster and what Jimmy Carter promised and all of the promises that we will give you money to pay the white folks off, all of those promises they broke when Ronald Reagan told the people of Zimbabwe, I don't like the way you vote in the UN. We vote one way, you vote the other way. But if I'm independent, I should be able to vote my own conscience, not the conscience of America because you're giving me some crumbs. So the land is the key. So if you're going to Africa and the Africans give you land in Ghana, I own land. The minister brought 23 plots in Ghana. The nation owns land. But we own it for 99 years with the right to turn it over to whoever's behind you, your son or your group and so forth. And they renew it for 99 years. But the land, my brother Kofi is, where's Kofi at? It's stool land. It belongs to the people always because land is akin to their soul. Now let's look at the business opportunities in Africa. That's what I want to talk about. It, they say, Akbar, what kind of business opportunities exist in Africa? I have a DVD on the back on my tour talking about living, working, and doing business in Africa. The one thing, they come to me, they say, what kind of business? I said, think of a general store in the Old West. Whatever you want, you went to that general store. That's the business opportunity in Africa. Don't try to, what do you do? That's the first thing I ask you. What do you do? Whatever you do, you can do it in Africa. There's an opportunity to do it. The brothers who were talking about the connection, and you were saying that there has to be action that will take place. The number one thing on our tours to Africa, and thousands of us go to Africa every year, in Ghana, we got 90,000 black Americans a year visiting the country of Ghana. And uh, I must, you know, blow my horn a little. We took the largest delegation of any group, 1,900 people for our convention. But those 1,900 people that went there in October of 1994, they would have never went to Africa unless somebody gave them a reason. The reason was announced in California by Minister Farrakhan the year before at one of our conventions. He said, our next year we're going to Ghana. And when they heard Minister Farrakhan say that, then everybody had a reason to visit Africa for their first time. The African brothers in uh, Accra, when those people got off those planes, we chartered an Egypt Air 747. When they got off that plane and kissed the ground, some of the brothers in Ghana were laughing at them. They, and it was all on television. But they didn't understand the feeling of people who thought they would never get to the African continent. You would rather buy a plasma TV and one of these uh, super stereo sets for about three grand instead of investing two grand to go visit Africa because you, you just don't have the level of consciousness. The plasma TV that you can talk and brag to your friends and watch the Super Bowl is more important than putting your feet on African soil. So when they come to me and they ask me about business, I said, whatever you can do. The people who are teachers, doctors, lawyers, you can't earn the same money in Africa that you earn getting a job. And see, black folks in America, you always think of a job because white folks brought you here for a job. That's why you tell your children, uh, finish school, get your degree so you can get a good job. You never say so you can be free because your mindset is I always got to work for the white man in order to make it. But you have to break that out. So Africa offers this opportunity on the spiritual base. Here's Joseph, so, and, and I must say Jake Lamptey, who's a friend of mine, the whole theme of the Joseph was rooted in President Rollins' speech to the NBA in Detroit. 
and President Rollins and I sit down and we worked out the kind of projection he should make. And they should give former administrations the credit. I love Rollins because Rollins knew that the connection with Africans in the diaspora was a none. There was not a delegation that I brought, picked up the phone and called him that he wouldn't visit that delegation and bring them to the castle. You can't isolate yourself. So Rollins encouraged it. And even though people said he had a beef with Kwame Nkrumah, he really took a page from Kwame Nkrumah in order to get Africans in the diaspora involved. So we, and he delivered a speech, if you can get a copy of it. And in the speech he said, it's like Joseph, sold into bondage by his brothers. Went into Egypt, the most powerful government at that time. He got the learning of the Egyptians. Then he snatched apart from the prodigal son. And when his home, his father and brothers were in trouble at home, and he ended up because of maneuvering with the key to the greenery. So there was a famine in the land of his father and brother, and he went home with that key and opened it up. Now Africa has a famine of know-how. White folks have shackled them with systems that just don't work. And when I first got to Ghana, and I wanted to get a letter to clear some things in customs. I had to, the letter had to go to this person, that person, this person had to sign off it, this person had to read it, this person had to stamp it. I said, what is this madness? That's the baggage left by the colonial master because he couldn't trust no black folk. So he had double checkers on the checkers and it has stymied them in terms of getting things done. So we have to break through that today. But the people and the ambassador uh, assistant said it right, that we got to know how we built America for these white folks. Why can't we now use that knowledge to build the African continent? And all we have to do is open that door. So let me do this quickly. Doing business in Africa. First thing, what do you want to do? Don't go try to find something new. What do you want to do? One brother came to Ghana from New York. He went into the pharmaceutical, just bottling stuff. Because they found out just uh, the raw materials were bottled in Europe. One brother came and went into the pineapple business. I was in Geneva. I went downstairs to buy some pineapples in the central Geneva. And I looked and said, they look like pineapples from Ghana. You know, you can kind of tell. The pineapples in Ghana are the sweetest pineapples in the world, pound for pound. When I first ate them, I said, I was sitting in a, in the, a hotel and I ordered some pineapple. I said, they put sugar and honey on these pineapples. I couldn't believe a pineapple was that sweet. Once you eat one, those dull pineapples from Hawaii, you wouldn't touch them. You would throw them in the garbage. So the Europeans, and they come from the central region, the central region pineapples. The Europeans fly pineapples out of Ghana. They have cargo planes every night. They load it with pineapple. Now, can you imagine that? The pineapple in the field is about 15 cents or less. They were selling it in Geneva for eight dollars. I trans, uh, I took those uh, Swiss francs, translated into dollars. It was eight dollars and fifteen cents for a pineapple that cost fifteen cents in Ghana. So brothers have gone over canning business. There's a brother that went and opened up a gym. Uh, the first rental car agency owned by uh, in Africa, actually the first one, other than when South Africa became free, was a sister named Mona Boyd from here in the state who owns uh, Avis Rental Car. So there's many opportunities, but how do you get, and I'm only talking about Ghana. Now if we want some action on Zimbabwe, all we have to do is say, how many people want to support Robert Mugabe? There's a big, there's a big controversy over the eighth pack. Now we're lobbying to have it in Zimbabwe. This is the Pan-African uh, Conference, the Pan-African Congress meeting. There's another group that's lobbying against it. And one of my brothers that I met with up at Syracuse University, I spoke up there on the 40, 41st anniversary of Malcolm's assassination, he's lobbying against it because he don't feel that we should take it there in light of the pressure that's on Mugabe. That's all the more reason we should take it there. So now, if you want some direct action, we need a charter of the plane. We only need 189 people. I have a brother here named Brother Kenneth in uh, Holiday Travel. He does all of the travel for the nation. He can pick up the phone Monday morning, call World Airlines that's based here in Atlanta and say, we want a plane to go from Atlanta, say, to Harare in Zimbabwe, and we load it with our people. We take them to the, uh, the clouds that thunder. They call it Victoria Fall, uh, Tatenda, okay? <laughs> so we take them there. We take them to the stone city. 
where J.A. Rogers said that white folks tried to say that the builders of this city had to come from uh, Lebanon. They had to be King Solomon's people because they found cedar, not giving credit to black people who built the stone city. The name of the country Zimbabwe means the house of stone, and, and they built it. And we go there and show our support for a black man that stood up for the land of the people and said that he would champion that until he died. How could he ask men or women to fight? So if you want to do business in Africa, there's gold in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is rich. You should ask the Oppenheimer family, Nikki Oppenheimer, who owns over 600 acres of land, hectares of land, which is bigger than acres of land. But the richness of the country itself and when Cecil Rhodes first went there, he realized that this was a tremendously rich country. They were supplying most of Europe with all their tobacco. Their cattle were the best. Zimbabwe was a strong, rich, beautiful country. And because Mugabe said that we promised these warriors that they would get their land back after this struggle, and then white folks didn't want to release the land, and he started kicking them out. But the reason they want to contain Mugabe is because what Mugabe did is contagious. Now in South Africa, people are talking about their land. Now the people in Botswana are talking about their land. Now the people in Kenya are talking about their land. Because Mugabe started the ball rolling, so the Europeans now are down on him, and this is why we must stand by him. Doing business in Africa, okay? Let me get back to it. On the west coast of Africa, soon when Colin Powell was in, poor Colin, um, <laughs> But Colin Powell told Bush, and Richard Clark wrote him in his, in his book, he said that if you go into Iraq, if you break it, it belongs to you. And God knows it's broke right now, and Bush don't know what to do. He's losing his mind over what's happening over there. But Colin Powell, one of the first countries, and I want you to look at this, America, yes, Bush said it right, finally, we are an oil junkie. And we strung out on oil, and just as the brother who strung out on cocaine, uh, heroin in New York would hit an old woman in the head, snatch a pocketbook, break in a second story, do anything to get the money for his fix. That's how America is with this oil now. They'll do anything, start wars, kill people, and all of that because they're dependent on oil. But they know that they made a mess here in the Middle East, a real sure enough mess, between the Palestinians uh, and Hamas, they preach democracy, so the Palestinians 10 years ago wouldn't vote because of the respect for Arafat, the father, of, you know, the father of the struggle. But when Hamas became strong, who they, this is their Frankenstein because they engineered the start of the Islamic groups in Palestine. But when they began to see it, they came strong and now they're in power now and this is creating a problem there because America needs Israel as a post there to protect its oil interests in the Middle East. Now that there's problems all over the Middle East with oil, the best next spot where the best and richest oil is West Africa. All down here in West Africa, the fine of oil and Chad. So now we want to do business. We have to take a page from what happened in, the, in Chile. Uh, when, the, when the Jimmy Carter uh, was president, the Russians invaded Afghanistan, which is still a problem right now. So what Jimmy Carter told the Russians, you come out of Afghanistan, we're going to cut off all wheat deliveries to you. So the Russians had to search the world for wheat, doing business in Africa. And the Russians went to a country, Chile, but the Communist Party was banned in Chile. So the Russians' deal was lift the ban off our party, make them the brokers, and we'll buy wheat from them. So it's the same thing that we have to do. America now is interested in oil. We have to petition these weak leaders in West Africa. Say that if you want oil there, you got 40 million of descendants of Africa that you robbed from Africa. They are, they are next to hungry, naked, broke, out of doors. We want them and their leadership to be the brokers for this oil deal that you want for West Africa, empowering us. Now I learned this from Rollins. Rollins said, look, they just gave me $163 million on some project I presented. The World Bank gave him the money. The next thing, he, and he's sitting in his office at Akbar, so the next thing they have to do a feasibility study. So they send these young white Americans in here. They give them a $5,000 a month uh, per diem. They pay them a salary, fine them over their business class. And they look over the project and say, it looks all right, give Rollins the money. 
So he said to me, why don't you get some, do you got any black Americans that can do this? I said, of course we do. I said, but Mr. President, you got to empower them. You got to say to them, look, I appreciate all these people you're sending, but don't I have some descendants in America who can handle this same thing? Empower us to do business in Africa. Most people are afraid of business in Africa. But there's a man that wrote what they don't teach at the Harvard Business School. You remember that book? There's a section in there that says that international business is where it's at, but most Americans are afraid of that. So these brothers who got tremendous money, remember that my man who owns Black Enterprise, Earl Graves, wrote nothing about Africa until South Africa became independent in 1994. Go back and read it. He didn't talk about business opportunities in Africa, investment in Africa, none of that until South Africa became independent is when he ran his first story on Africa. So let's talk about how you can do business in Africa. First, there's the oil. The struggle from I can start in the Guinea Bissau and go all the way down the west coast of Africa and you could stop in Angola but even Namibia, there's oil all off, off the coast. The struggle in Liberia is off the tremendous oil fines that they know that are off the coast. They brought up the oil in Chad and ran a pipeline through the Cameroons. And they told the Chadians that we gonna manage your money because your Negroes don't know how to manage money because we got you the poorest country in Africa, so we gonna manage the money. So a few weeks ago, the Chadians backed out of that because they were treating them like boys. They wanted their money, and now there's a conflict between Chad and the Sudan. And it's over this area called Darfur that is rich not only with oil, but it has gold, uranium, I mean, name it, it's all in this area called Darfur here. And they, the conflict here is not as deep as the conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where in the last four or five years, nearly four, four million people have been killed. And over a period of 20 years in the Sudan, three million have been killed. But yet, and still, the focus is not on the Democratic Republic. The focus was not on uh, uh, the Rwanda and Uganda for sending troops in and the slaughter of the people. The focus is not on it because it doesn't have the kind of interest that they want in the Sudan because they need to change the government in the Sudan. Killing, raping of anyone is wrong. You can't justify that. But you have to look at the motive. They're talking about sending NATO in, but America really wants to go in their cell. America has started now, this is doing business in Africa. They have started in Dabuji, right here. They got a base in Dabuji, they got soldiers there. They have uh, told President Kafour that we will train your army. So they got soldiers now in Ghana, which hurts me when I see them in the airport coming into Ghana, and it's supposed to be a friendly thing. They got soldiers in Uganda. Museveni was strong, but they, they wooed him. They brought him in. This is why he had the election that he had that he won the other day. So now if the African-American community or black Americans, Africans in the diaspora, are going to do business in Africa, you must find a way in. We may criticize Leon Sullivan, but Leon Sullivan found a door to get in. The door was through teaching. Um, President John Kennedy used the Peace Corps most of us that couldn't afford to buy a ticket to Africa joined the Peace Corps so we could get to Africa. Now we got to change this around. We have to find a door into Africa so we can begin to convey ideas. Our scholars must do books on towards understanding Africans in the diaspora. It hurts me in Ghana to see all of the young students, their image of black America comes from Ebony and Jet. Now that, that's their image of where we at, so we all either rich we all making it, there's really no problems in America. That's their image, that's why they'll give their right arm to get here to America, because they think everything is so beautiful. But we need the real picture conveyed to these young students on the African continent. So if you're gonna do business in Africa, and I'm gonna close out on this, because I know you need questions. One thing that, you know, as a, a member of the Nation of Islam, that that Million Man March opened every door on the African continent for us. Because the enemy showed it to the world because they thought we were going to get out there and fight. They said, no way that Farrakhan can bring a million black men into Washington. When they get through drinking wine, smoking dope, and, and smoking crap, those Negroes will be fighting on that mall. So they were about to show the world how civilized we were. But it was the most peaceful march in the history of America. And it opened doors all across the African continent. 
From the time that we landed, every country we went to, Minister Farrakhan got the red carpet treatment, and we opened doors. But you know where our weakness was? We didn't have the brilliant minds of black business people in America, uh, engineers, architects, people who are economists, to walk in behind us and keep those doors open for our community. So we made that mistake. If you're going to make a mistake, let it not be a mistake we've already made. If you're going to make a mistake, let it be a new mistake. So I'm sharing with you the mistake that we made. So when you go into Africa, you got to find, assess what is needed. Then you have to lobby these governments. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to try to close right here. Gabon. When I went to Gabon, it's a country, not even a million people. They're rich with oil. Omar Bongo, who became a Muslim, many people say Gaddafi converted him. But Omar Bongo has a rich country. Now, one of the things that we can lobby for is all of our brothers in prison are political prisons. It's a big, big business. Why can't, we, why can't we lobby some of these countries to take men who have reformed themselves? There's a book out now called Aging Prisoners. And I hope that uh, you will get a copy of it. You have to order it probably of Aging Prisoners, but it's talking about black men who went to prison when they were 25 years old and got 50 years, and they're still sitting in prison. I just came from Auburn, and I'm going to tell you, after I spoke to those inmates and listened to them, tears were in my eyes. A man in there 31 years, he didn't kill a policeman, he just shot his gun towards a policeman and they have never given him parole. These brothers are rotting in the way in the prisons of America. Africa is the opportunity for us. And what we want is skilled people who have trained, who have educated themselves, who have a dexterity that they can offer to the development of Africa. One of the things in a country, the way that uh, Mugabe could really uh, point his nose at America saying you're paying up to $52,000 a year to incarcerate black men. 2.4 million people in prison. 80% of them black descendants of Africa. They're not all criminals. There must be something messed up with your system in America. Give us a chance so that they can build a new reality on the African continent. And if they don't do it, the way you got to do America, you got to shame America. You got, that's what the Cold War was about. Shaming America to try to make her do right. She's not going to do right because she's morally fit and she thinks, oh God, let me do the right thing. Now when it comes to us, that's out of the picture. Katrina showed us that. But we can use the African continent as a buffer to show America that these leaders are offering a new opportunity on the continent. My last thing, the African Development Bank. It was located in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and it was running, trying to help projects in Africa. Then the government here totally collapses. Robert Kaplan in 1993 wrote about the collapse of governments in Africa. It happened in Somalia. These governments totally collapsed and they're trying to do it to a few more. The, uh, the DRC. These are governments that, this is the, one of the richest countries, not in Africa, but in the world. There's enough wealth in the DRC to rebuild all of Europe again to rebuild it again. But yet and still, there's a collapse. And in these collapses, America still is able to pull out, keep the people divided. So what we have to do now is the African Development Bank was moved to Tunisia. And Brother Gaddafi, you know, he's an Arab. And the years that I've known him, the whole African Union is Brother Gaddafi's thrust. He put the money behind it, he brought those leaders in, and so forth. He moved the African Union forward because the African leaders would not do it, but he used the name. He went to his first uh, OAU conference in many years in Algeria in the July of 1998. And he stood up there and delivered an hour and a half speech, and in that speech, the key points, he said, if you don't unite, you're all going to be destroyed. He said, well, you will never make it. And, you, and then he invoked the name of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Gamal Nasser, Sekou Touré, Keita of Mali, all of these old heads who had the idea of a United States of Africa when they formed the uh, OAU, but there were many countries that were not liberated. He said, if we don't do this, we got to have one currency, one passport. You're talking about dual citizenship. If you have dual citizenship to Africa, you have 53 passports? No, the European Union has one passport that says European Union in the country they come from. And they walk through the airport, they just hold it up and keep stepping. I was in Burkina Faso and I want to go to Cote d'Ivoire. You know what hurt me? 
being that after Thomas and Cara was killed, there was bad blood between Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso. I had to go to the French to get a visa to go to Cote d'Ivoire. And you know what I said to the brother? I said, it's like me going to the master, saying, master, would you stamp my passport so I can go visit my brother? That's what it was like. But if we have an African Union, there's one passport. And on ours it will say, uh, African Union, the diaspora. And that means that you can move to all of the African countries without visa. The last thing, this is doing business in Africa. That if you are a, a citizen of the African nations, you can do business as a citizen. There's certain businesses like in Ghana, hairdressing, taxi cab, it's reserved for the local people. You don't have to put up a certain amount of money because you're a foreigner, but you're treated like an African and you can go into business. Now there's much more to it and I don't want to be long-winded and you know I told you about Muslim ministers, you got to bring a box lunch when they start preaching, okay? But I want to thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity. I hope we can answer some questions for you. Well, one thing I want to say, that on the table out back, I'm sorry I don't have uh, the uh, confessions of an economic hitman. The way you handle books is that you get study groups because there's so many books out there, you're not going to read them all. So you can study groups, you can read a certain amount of pages and then share the information. There's another book called Diplomacy by Deceit. It tells you what the Western world has done to the nations in the world. But those two books are good for an Afrocentric study group so that you can understand where uh, economics come into. You can't just talk about unifying Africa and so forth. You gotta understand that there's an economic hitman out there that's gonna stop you from trying to do anything you wanna do. I want you to look at the land, uh, look at the uh, DVD on the free land in Ghana. And the land is there, you can get it, but you have to develop within three years. If you want a pension, and you're looking for a place that you like to go and relax for a while and leave uh, Atlanta in the winter time, it's there, you can go and build that home in Ghana for $40,000. You should see what you'll be able to get in the Volta region of Ghana. Thank you, Mel, I bless you, Assemble. minutes or so. We're also going to hear from Sister Jerry Algani, Brother Joseph Carswell, and we're going to take a short break, pull back most of our key speakers from throughout the day, make a panel of those key speakers so that we can have a real in-depth Q&A session up to the end of this evening. I just wanted to, because I know we're, we're making sort of a shift here, and I just wanted to throw one piece in there that, yes, we, just like I, do business in Africa. But my business is serving. And I just wanted to remind folks also that just as uh, Brother Rob mentioned earlier also, because there's so many places that are in crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, as my brother said, not tomorrow, not next week. You don't wait until you retire and have investments so you can go and buy land. Now, babies are being born dead. Parents are dying and leaving children to take care of children. Now is where you can go and serve. And don't let people tell you that nonprofit means no money. Okay, don't let them fool you that way. It simply means what you do with your money serves more than just a few. All right, so I just wanted to put that out there and I think that'll be a part of a question and discussion we can come into later. And with no further ado, I wanna turn this one now over to Sister and Jerry, and then if you would, Brother Joseph, just immediately follow behind and we'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Stay black inside your mind. Stay black inside your mind. Stay black, stay black, stay black, stay black. Stay black, stay black, stay black. Stay black, stay black, stay black. Stay black inside your mind. 
stay black inside your mind. I just want to greet you all with that so that we can every day just shake off this European standard of, of quality of life and make that transformation and just stay black inside your mind. Yeah. All of us may not get to Africa, but we can stay black inside of our minds. I want to greet you, all of us. I see so many brothers and sisters, so many walks of life. Shalom to my Hebrew brothers and, and sisters. Shalom, shalom. alaikum to my Muslim brothers and sisters. Hotel to my African centered brothers and sisters. What's up? <laughs> Free the land. By any means necessary, the land is ours. And it is U N I T Y. Unity. Unity. Unity that brings us here today for this African summit. I don't want us to forget that. It is about the unity of our spirit, the unity of our purpose, and certainly the unity of our work. And I greet you as your representative, your Southeast representative from the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. That is Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, and Tennessee. So I greet you with reparations now. Reparations now. Because truly, truly, I hear that we are engaged in repair work for our people, whether that is spiritual repair, or physical repair, or economic repair, we are engaged in repair work. Because our people suffer from hunger, they suffer from miseducation, they suffer from the, the criminal injustice system. We suffer from the homelessness. And with Katrina, we suffer from neglect from this, the United States of America. So that it is unity that brought us here today. It is unity and self-determination that one day, one day, one day. One day. <laughs> we will reach our motherland. But that, first, but that first area that we need to reach it is in our minds. And then we manifest that in a unified plan of action because certainly we have supported the Hebrew Israelites. I know I've been buying ice cream since 1983 or 1973. So it's our monies that have also supported that movement and that transformation. And I know I've been buying bean pies forever. So it is our monies and our unity that have built all of the nations within this nation of the United States. And so I greet you. I greet you with the battle cry of reparations now because we are certainly in need of total repair for our people. But at the same time, it is a debt owed our ancestors. This is a spiritual movement that we're about. And so it is a debt owed. So, this, so we are also engaged in the justice in the justice that we need to demand because it is the debt owed our people. And we can't let them forget that our people struggle, blood, sweat, tears, cruelties, discrimination, atrocities, Katrina. Yes. And we can't let this country forget. We can't let them forget that spirit. And we also must, must also acknowledge that the future belongs to all of us. These crackers don't have the dibs on the future. 